Deer and Company is clearly a cyclical stock, as you can tell by looking at its operating earnings going back to 2003. You can see there are periods where earnings dip and then rise and then dip and then rise and then dip and then We've had very strong earnings recently, and a lot of that has to do with a more than trillion dollar infrastructure spending that we feel that Deer and Caterpillar are going to participate in. But what is not cyclical about Deer is the dividend. As you can see, they've increased their dividend every year, year after year after year. So when we're looking at a cyclical stock, we have to recognize that you know this company can be a great dividend growth stock, but you also have to understand that it is cyclical. But most importantly, I think cyclical stocks really demonstrate clearly how price follows operating earnings or price follows the fundamental value or performance of the company over time, as you can clearly see by John Deere and company. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. And once again, it's my real pleasure to bring you a video here. I'm going to look at two what I call dividend growth stocks, but both of them are cyclical stocks. But on the same time, you can refer to these as cyclical stocks. You can also refer to them as long-term growth stocks with some pauses in between. And I think you have to look at that and you have to understand that clearly. So let's start again by looking at Deer, which I previewed in the beginning. And, you know, I'm going to put the normal price to earnings ratio added to this graph and, you know, from the standpoint of price, you can see how price tracks earnings, and you can see that the most optimum times to buy the company are when the price gets below the earnings and the normal P.E. ratio, as we see here, because this company has grown earnings at 18% a year. Now, if I shorten the time frame, I do want you to notice how this information changes, and now we start to see a 15 P.E. ratio being relatively you know, accurate for them. Now, the company's had some real strong growth based on the you know more than trillion dollar infrastructure spending that's going on. All our roads are in disrepair, and Deere is participating in that with their heavy construction. But its primary focus is agriculture and farm machinery as well. That's one of the things that you know distinguishes Deere from Caterpillar, which we're also going to look at. But the company is A-rated. It's a very high-quality company. It has 44% debt to capital. It offers a 1.34% current dividend yield, and it can be bought at a price earnings ratio, a blended price earnings ratio of 13.3, and an earnings yield currently of 7.62%, which is a full percentage of point above my, you know, favorite. So I like Deer very much, and I think it's a, you know, excellent company and an excellent buy at these levels. Now, long term, when you look at this company, even though it's cyclical. When you look at historical performance, I want you to note that the dividend has grown by over 12% a year. And if you look at it in a comparison to the market over this long period of time, it has outperformed the market rather substantially. And it's done it both on a dividend basis as well as a capital appreciation basis. And it's been quite remarkable. But I also want to point out there will be periods when valuations are not in a line or a company is cyclical like this will not outperform. But in the long run, they perform very well. So this is John Deere, and we like it very, very much from a standpoint of operating cash flows. And I'm going to shorten this time frame to, you know, post the Great Recession, if you will. We see operating cash flows have really covered the dividend, you know, quite well. Free cash flow is a little different matter. And we're going to take a look at the financials here a little bit later so that we get some more clarity. Now, there are some caveats here that I want to point out. If I look at price to EBITDA of John Deere, it's trading at a rather high multiple of price to EBITDA, trading at a rather low multiple of earnings, which I do think is a, the, the real asset test for the company long term. But the fact that it's trading at a high multiple of EBITDA is a red flag that should be considered. And also the price to sales is relatively high compared to normal standards. So, you know, that's the historical look, if you will, at John Deere. Now going into Caterpillar, which is the, you know, the second stock that you want to feature, we have very similar characteristics as we do with Deere. So we're going to start with operating earnings here. And what we're going to go back to the maximum level. And as you can see, operating earnings and stock price correlate very, very nicely on this company. You can see that, you know, in times of rising earnings, you know, investors can get excited. But, you know, when earnings get above the orange line, they come back into alignment. But they generally tend to follow it or track it. 
But once again, we've got a dividend story. Caterpillar is a dividend aristocrat. Now, it's a little confusing when you look at the performance report here because we do show a dividend cut, but that's because the company paid five dividends in 2012 and only three dividends in 2013. That's a little confusing, but Standard & Poor's, I guess, considers it a dividend aristocrat. Once again, when you look at the long-term performance, you see that it has outperformed the S&P and has a dividend growth rate of over 11%, and it's been maintaining pretty high dividend growth rates here recently. So, you know, that's one thing I like about both of these companies. Looking at the yield on cost, you know, the yield on cost went from about 3% back in 2003 up to almost uh, over 19% last year. So, you know, these companies have what I call growth yield. People like to use the word yield on cost. But my point is you can look at Caterpillar and John Deere as companies that can increase their dividend year after year. Now, once again, when I look at operating cash flow, I feel like operating cash flow has been very strong, especially since the Great Recession. Free cash flow, again, is another story, and that's something that needs to be looked into a little bit more. But they have a better record than we saw with Deer on free cash flow. Then we go to EBITDA here. Price to EBITDA, once again, is a little high, but not quite as bad as what we saw with John Deere. And price to sales is also a little high based on historical standards. So those are caveats. But again, these companies have catalyst right now that's moving them forward, which is the, you know, all the roads in our country need to be repaired. And worldwide, we have a, a trillion dollar plus infrastructure spending going on today. Both of these companies are worldwide operators. And before I get into the forecasting and look at the forecasting, I'm going to turn the video over to my son, Colton, and have him look at some key financial statement metrics on both of these companies here for you. Because, again, the fast graphs gives you the indication that these companies might be attractive right now. One thing I don't think either of them really offers is a great margin of safety. I do believe John Deere offers a little better margin of safety at current valuation than Caterpillar does, but both of these are reasonably valued stocks. They're extremely high quality. You know, Deere has a lower dividend of 1.34%. If I look at, you know, go back into Caterpillar here, Caterpillar offers a little higher dividend at 2.1%, but it offers maybe less growth potential than Deere. But both of these companies are extremely high quality with strong balance sheets and good you know, cash flow statements, and they have great dividend records and offer dividend growth. And, and they have a catalyst right now that would give them some impetus for some growth going forward. But again, before I do that, I'm going to turn this over to my son, Colton, and let him talk to you and go through the financial statements a little bit. Hey, everyone, Colton Carnival here. So I'm going to primarily look at the balance sheet and the cash flow statement for these two companies. And I'm going to be looking at these in the uh, quarterly form for like the last 15 quarters or so. And all in all, it seems like and it, it definitely really is that Caterpillar is a more liquid company than Deer is. Um, Deer seems to be a slightly riskier, slightly s financially set up riskier, and I, I'll get into why. Now, all of the data that I am about to show you in an Excel sheet is all pulled from the financial statements found underneath the financials tab. And I have a few other data items pulled, just like two data items that I pulled from the 10Q. So when looking at the the balance sheet for Caterpillar, you know, they are maintaining a relatively healthy cash balance. And if we look at the cash and short-term investments as a, a percent of total assets, you know, their their cash and short-term investments are definitely somewhat decreasing, but you know, they went from 10% up into like 13, 14% then down to 8%, right? So, I mean, it is a little flat and it's a little decreasing, but I wouldn't be that concerned about the cash percent of assets. Um, if we take a look at inventories, you know, inventories are increasing as a percent of assets and, you know, they are increasing relatively quickly as a percent of assets. And that is due to support higher sales numbers. So their sales numbers are increasing nicely. Their inventories are making up a majority of their sales. Inventories make up a majority of sales for both of these companies, but the inventories as a percent of assets are increasing decently nice here, as well as the sales revenue increase. So if we take a look at Quarterly sales revenues, you know, we're looking at 15.8 billion down from 16.5 billion in quarter four. But generally, you know, 
it's gone up from 13 billion up to 15 billion. So we are seeing a nice increase of sales and that is being supported by higher inventory levels. So, you know, the risk with higher inventory levels would be over purchasing inventory and basically using up a ton of cash that isn't as liquid. And, you know, they could end up sitting on a lot of inventory and not selling it. But, you know, Caterpillar is increasing their sales as well. So, you know, I I don't necessarily see a risk in that. They are just setting themselves up for higher increases of sales and a support of higher sales. One thing that is nice to see is the long-term receivable notes. You know, this makes up a relatively small portion of their current assets, and it's actually decreasing, which is nice to see. This means they have more liquidity, they have less receivables out, right? So they're not dealing with a risk of not getting their money back, not getting their receivables. This is loans that they have lent out to customers, and, you know, this is only making a up of 15.6 down from 17.4 percent of total assets this is going to be really important what we're going to look at when comparing to the deer balance sheet and then another point that i wanted to check out which this right here is the data specifically the revenues from financial products that i pulled from the 10 q's so we are seeing a decrease in long-term notes receivable but we are, and we're, we're slightly seeing a decrease in percent of revenue from the financial products, but a slight increase in the revenue itself. So even though they are decreasing their long-term notes receivable on their balance sheet, they're slightly increasing the revenue from it, but it does make up a very small portion of their revenue. Their, their revenue does mostly come from you know selling product, which is good to see. Now, I I do want to jump over to the John Deere balance sheet, and we will kind of compare these same numbers. So cash and short-term investments, we'll we'll start there and just look at a percent of the uh, total assets. You know, it is lower than Caterpillar. So right off the bat, John Deere is already slightly less liquid. Inventories, significantly less than the inventories percent of assets from Caterpillar. But, you know, we are seeing some... increases from it, you know, 6 billion up to 9 billion. So they're kind of going through the same thing. They are increasing their, their sales revenue. We'll take a look at that really quickly over here. They are increasing their sales revenue over time and it is being supported by higher, higher inventories, um, which once again, you know, the risk in that is that they might not sell all of their inventory and it could be, you know, basically blown money and, and whatnot, but it is being used to support higher sales numbers, which is nice. But The bigger issue that I see with John Deere um, in terms of liquidity is the long-term notes receivable. So we are seeing an increase from 31 billion to 44 billion, you know, compared to long-term notes receivable, you know, staying relatively flat, if not decreasing a little bit for Caterpillar. So we're seeing a large increase in notes receivable, which once again, those are loans that they have given out to customers essentially. And, you know, that's, that's money that they don't have. And the risk of that is that's money that they may not get. And where we can really see where that issue is, is long-term notes receivable in terms of a percent of total assets is, is pretty high. You know, Caterpillars is only 15, 16%. Whereas John Deere's long-term notes receivable makes up almost half of their total assets. Um, That is a very, I would say that is a bigger or a a big red flag. I mean, it's a lot bigger than Caterpillar's. Um, Once again, Caterpillar and all of this seems to be significantly more liquid than John Deere. We're going to take a look at the current and quick ratios here in a second for both of these companies. But I wanted to now then compare the financial, you know, interest income revenue um, like we did on Caterpillar as a percent of revenue and whatnot. So, you know, their long-term notes are increasing significantly. And, you know, this is quarter two to quarter two. So if we take a look at this quarter and this quarter, you know, we've seen a large increase in long-term notes receivable. This is quarter one to quarter one, whereas we actually saw a decrease in long-term notes receivable with an increase in the actual value here for revenue um, from Caterpillar, but a decrease in total sales. We saw somewhat of an opposite, but somewhat of the same. You know, We saw increase in income, but what we did also see was an increase in the percent of income. So John Deere is making a, you know, less money off of selling their product and more off of interest income. You know, that can be a risk definitely because once again, receivables are a risky thing, 
But, you know, inventory can be a risky thing as well. I just wanted to point out, though, that John Deere is, while, while their values are still relatively low, they have a higher percent of their revenue coming from interest than Caterpillar. And it's increasing as a percent of revenue versus decreasing. So one other thing that I said I wanted to look at is the quick and current ratios for John Deere and Caterpillar. So underneath underneath the ratios tab in fund graphs, we're going to go to the quarterly tab and we're going to take a look at the current and quick ratios. So this is generally a, I'll call it a red flag. You know, I've been saying that John Deere is less liquid than Caterpillar. A current ratio and a quick ratio less than one is kind of a bad sign. A current ratio is total current assets divided by total current liabilities. And so that means how many times does their current assets cover their current liabilities? So, you know, in in the case of, of John Deere, this would actually mean that their current liabilities are greater than their current assets. So they're technically like in a way insolvent. I'm not saying they're going out of business, but what I am saying is their current assets do not cover their current liabilities. And we'll kind of see what they're doing with long-term debt a little bit later, but just as a hint, you know, Deer is increasing their long-term debt significantly a lot more than Caterpillar is. And that is probably due to a liquidity issue. And then just so you guys know, if, if you don't, a quick ratio is very similar to the current ratio but um, instead of current assets divided by current liabilities, it's current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. So it is more of a, you know, an even more acid test of their liquidity. So if we take a look at now CAT and its current and quick ratios, you know, we see their current ratio being significantly higher than one, 1.43, 1.39, you know, even up into 1.61. So they cover their current liabilities while John Deere doesn't. And then even including or subtracting out inventory, you know, their quick ratio hovers just around a one, you know, slightly below. And we've seen a little less liquidity um, due to the higher amount of inventory that they're bringing on. But I would still say Caterpillar is, you know, extremely liquid, especially when compared to John Deere. So the next thing I do want to take a look at are the cash flow statements for each one of these companies. And once again, you know, all of this data is pulled from the financial statements found on fast graphs, but I wanted to throw it in here because since we're looking at quarterly, I wanted to look at last 12 month values for Caterpillar, the last 12 month operating cash flow. I mean, it's increasing. So that's a good sign across the board. Um, I don't think there's much to talk about there in terms of CapEx. CapEx is staying relatively flat. You know, they're just kind of reinvesting the same amount into the business, but you know, they are able to compound the growth of their operating cash flow while not necessarily increasing the investments into CapEx that much, which is a fairly good sign, I would say. Last 12 month uh, investing cash flow, you know, it is staying relatively flat over this time period, but we did see a balloon of investing cash flow a few quarters ago. And that was primarily due to purchase of investments. So, you know, if we were to take a look at the um, financial statements here, go to cash flow statements and then purchase and sales of investments, you know, back during this time, they were making some decent sized purchases of investments. And, you know, that that's where we saw the balloon in outflow for uh, um, investing cash flow, but staying relatively normalized, I wouldn't say there's there's much risk here. And then finally, we've got the last 12 month financing cash flow, you know, this has ballooned over the last few years up from 4.8 billion up to uh, 6.6 billion of outflows and even into the seven billions of outflows. And that's primarily due to stock repurchases. So if we take a look here, you know, they are repurchasing a decent bit amount of stock. So, you know, that's what they are using their financing cash flow for. And then ultimately we are seeing a net change in cash. Sorry, this last 12 month net change in cash is what we need to focus on. You know, they are cash negative sometimes, but once again, if we take a look at their cash and short-term investments, they are maintaining a relatively healthy cash balance. You know, we, we have been seeing this decrease happen as we can see right here, you know, big cash outflows. Um, but that's primarily due to repurchasing stock. And I'm not really necessarily worried about what's happening to their cash balances, nor am I worried about their cash generation because, you know, they could stop repurchasing stock and they are increasing their operating cash flow. So the business itself is generating more money. 
So now let's take a look at John Deere's cash flow statement. So once again, we're going to look at a similar Excel sheet set up the same way. All of this data is pulled from the financial statements. So starting with the operating cash flow for this company, uh, it's staying, staying relatively flat. You know, we saw this balloon back here, big drop, and then it kind of recovered, but it's staying relatively flat. And, you know, that's, that's less of a good sign than uh, what Caterpillar is experiencing. We are seeing a major increase in last 12 month CapEx. We saw it go from 3.4 billion to 4.2 billion, where remember Caterpillar stayed relatively flat. So we're seeing this large CapEx increase, but operating cash flow isn't really increasing. Whereas with Caterpillar, remember, we saw a pretty much a flat CapEx with a pretty nice increase in, in operating cash flow. So once again, there's a weakness there, in my opinion, for John Deere. Net investing cash flow, if we take a look at the last 12 month, is increasing quite a bit. Went from 3.5 billion to 8 billion in outflows. That's primarily due to the increasing in outflows. So if we come here and we take a look at the investing cash flow for John Deere, we'll see that there that's primarily coming from this other funds category and FactSet bundles the change in receivables under here. So this is primarily due to the change in receivables. Remember, if we take a look back at the balance sheet for John Deere and look at the long-term notes receivable, we are seeing that large increase occur. So their receivables are increasing, which is a decrease in cash. Because remember, that's cash that's going out. And you know that's just a riskier thing to see than what is going on with Caterpillar and just a riskier thing to see in general. And then finally, if we take a look at the last 12 month financing cash flow, you know, it's generally positive. We've seen some negatives. We've seen some positives. But um, this is primarily due to issuing a lot of debt. You know, they are repurchasing shares as well. If we take a look back at the cash flow statement, they are change, you know, this change in capital stock. That means they are, this is cash being spent on repurchasing common and preferred stock. But look, they are issuing quite a bit of long term debt, which is, you know, changing the capital structure of this company, making them more debt heavy. And, you know, overall, in my opinion, making them more risky than Caterpillar. And then finally, we'll just compare the last 12 month net change in cash. You know, it's, it's increasing, decreasing over certain years. We take a look back at the balance sheet. You know, they are, their cash fluctuates and that, that's representative of this versus what Caterpillar is doing. Remember, their, their cash has been dropping. But once again, I, I don't really see it much of a risk. That's mainly due to share repurchases and whatnot. And that can stop. And their operating cash flow is increasing versus John Deere's kind of staying relatively flat. So based off of all these numbers, you know, I would say that Caterpillar is a safer investment, a safer company that's not talking about valuation or anything like that. This is just looking at the balance sheet and the cash flow statement of these companies. Caterpillar is a lot more liquid than John Deere is. Caterpillar is generating more operating cash flow than John Deere is. Its operating cash flow is increasing and they're relying less on notes receivables. You know, they are decreasing that value and de-risking themselves in that way. So in my opinion, Caterpillar would be the more solid company to invest in. And I'll leave the Chuck in his portion of the video to talk about the valuation of these two companies. And also don't forget to check out the links below the bottom of the video in the description to check out the research article that we have written for these companies. So that pretty much sums up everything for the financial statements of these companies. I'll throw it back to Chuck. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Colton. That was excellent. Now, you know, I've always said you can learn a great deal from the past. And as we looked at Caterpillar and John Deere, we see that we have learned a lot about them. They're cyclical stocks. And we understand that and we recognize that. And I think that's something you should take into consideration. But their dividend records, both are stellar. They've had very great dividend records, good dividend growth. So for the dividend growth investor who's looking maybe not necessarily for current yield today, but you know, income in the future, like the future retirement years, I think both of these would be excellent catalysts. But now let's look at forecasting and talk because you can only invest in the future. You can learn from the past, but you can only invest in the future. Now, I like to start out with the analyst scorecard. And because these companies are cyclical, I think it's important to point out that occasionally analysts miss estimates by quite a bit with these companies. But right now, the analysts are relatively sanguine. I've done, you know, there's quite a bit of research that I've already performed on both of these companies. And I will tell you that analysts are very, very positive. And you can see that estimates on Caterpillar 
have been increasing over the last six months on both for this year, next year, and the following year. So assuming Caterpillar trades at a 15 multiple and you know these earnings pass and the stock trades at that, we could see an upside of around 13% annualized. Using the normal multiple on the stock, which has been actually higher in Caterpillar's case over the last five years, we could see an even higher rate of return of over 21%. But I do want to point out recently, you know, forecast, now this was COVID related. So I think we'd have to take that into consideration. They missed big during COVID, but that was a hundred year event. Otherwise, looking at, you know, Caterpillar, it doesn't have a huge margin of safety. I would call Caterpillar fairly valued. It's got, you know, really good growth expected for this year and then a slowdown next year and then a, a resurgence of growth. Long-term growth on the company is expected to be very strong at 15%, and that's three to five years or longer. So I think Caterpillar is an attractive stock at you know today's levels. Going back to John Deere, I think John Deere might be a little more attractively valued. It has a little bit better margin of safety. It has over 30% growth forecast this year, a little bit less for next year and a little bit less for the following year, its long-term growth rate is also expected to be about 15%. So both of these companies look like attractive long-term plays. And, you know, research services like Morningstar and Zacks, you know, they've all talked about the long-term play of these companies. And that's what value investing is all about. It's about investing in the company so that you're participating in the growth and the performance of the company and the dividend growth of the company over the long run. And I think both of these companies offer, you know, a good, solid, attractive, long-term opportunity. They're very high-quality companies. They're both A-rated. They have, you know, reasonable debt levels and the cash flows to handle that. So if you look at Deer, you know, in comparison to Caterpillar, I think that, you know, opportunity is around 14% going forward. If I look at the normal multiple on Deer, the forecast would be about 23%. So Deer has a lower dividend yield, maybe a better margin of safety. Caterpillar, in contrast, doesn't quite have the margin of safety, but it has a better dividend yield. Both of them have excellent dividend records. And, you know, Caterpillar does offer a little bit higher dividend yield, but also a lower earnings yield, which means, you know, the valuation is not quite as good as it is for deer. But both of them, I think, would be excellent long-term candidates. Both of them participating in the infrastructure build-out. Both of them are iconic brands. They're some of the world's most, you know, recognized brands. They have strong dealerships. You know, we're going to talk about that in the research report that we're going to attach here. I've had James Long prepare a research report that will be included in this video. There'll be a link to it that you can go directly and look at the research that we've conducted. And of course, Colt went over the financial statements with you. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. We're looking at two infrastructure stocks here. They're not the greatest or the most you know, lowest value stocks, but I do want to point out that the, it's very rare that you find these stocks extremely undervalued. Now, they are cyclical, and that's something to take into consideration. But if you're looking for dividend growth and a long-term opportunity and high-quality companies, world-recognized dominant brands, both John Deere and Caterpillar might be interesting. In fact, you might want to take a position, you know, a part, you know, a half position in both and call it a full position in the, um, you know, opportunity that the infrastructure you know, offers us going future. If you enjoyed this video, give me a like, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and take a look at Fast Graphs. You know, it's a great tool to help investors understand the relationship between the company's business capabilities and the stock price. And I don't know of any other service that does it quite as well as Fast Graphs. So, you know, we offer a free trial. Take a look at it. And uh, thanks again for watching, and we'll be talking to you again real soon.